All right, good morning, Grace. If you are new, my name is Clay, and last week we had our send-off Sunday where we announced that we are leaving for Edmonton. Obviously, like Mark mentioned this morning, Jared and his family are in Edmonton currently, and we are still here for some reason. Mark was going to make a joke about how we had decided to not go and just leave the class and stranded there, but we're not actually going to do that. Um, you could say either that this is my last sermon as your pastor, or maybe because last week was the send-off Sunday, maybe this is the first time I'm coming back as a guest preacher, and maybe I'll come back more. Who knows? We'll see. But either way, we are, as you saw with that in little intro video, we're taking a little bit of a break from going through the gospel according to Luke, which is where we have been over the last while, and we are now taking the summer to go through some of the Psalms as uh, the series we're going to go through in the summer. So whenever we gather... If you've been here for a while, maybe this is your first Sunday or you've been here a couple times before, you will notice very quickly that what we love to do is preach and teach through the scriptures. Now, normally we do that through going through a book of, of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but every once in a while we take a little bit of a break, not a break from the Bible, but a break from the systematic look at a single book, and sometimes we'll go through Proverbs, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and in those instances, it doesn't make as much sense to always take it from the very beginning to the very end. So we might do a chapter at a time or a couple verses at a time. So today we're actually going to be going through chapter 13 in the Psalms. But the reason we go through the Bible is because we believe the Bible is God's word given to us. It's not just a book telling us how to live, what we must do to make ourselves right before God, but it actually reveals that the Bible is not about me and it's not about you. The Bible is entirely about Jesus Christ what he has done for us in the grand story of redemption. And it's only in knowing what Jesus has done for us that we can now respond to live a life that is now in contrast to how we were living before and now in obedience and faith because of what Jesus has done for us, that he died after living a perfect life that we should have lived he died the death that we should have died, and he rose again, defeating our enemies of Satan, sin, death, and hell, so that we could be rescued, we could be adopted, and brought into the family of God as sons of the kingdom, heirs to the throne, where we are now given full acceptance by God, in contrast to where we were trying to rule ourselves and essentially putting ourselves on the path of self-destruction. God brought us out of that, and it brings us into a path of glorious light. So now, if we think to the Psalms, and we're thinking about, okay, we're going through these Psalms, some of you, you, you get this picture in your head, it, these nice, comfortable images where you, you're like, okay, the Psalms, this is, this is comfy, this is secure, this is, I, I just like it, and so maybe you just picture yourself in a nice, cozy chair, wrapped up in a blanket by the fireplace, you're sipping hot cocoa, apple cider, tea, who knows, but you're comfortable, and, you, and you're just ready for a nice, easy devotional time with God. But maybe you saw the video and you go, that's not what I was expecting. When I think of the Psalms, I'm, like that intro video, is, it's disrupting my, my expectations. And that's because I think often we have our ideas of what we're going to find in the Bible, but then when we read it, something else happens. Because what I want us to see this morning as we look through Psalm 13 how we interact with God is not always easy. It's not always nice. It's not always comfortable. And there's times that dealing with God, dealing with this life that we live is actually scary. It's frustrating. And, and times just, sometimes it just feels tense. So if you haven't done so yet, please bring out your Bibles. Whether that's in book or app form, turn with me to Psalms chapter 13. If you need help finding it, it's going to be basically almost right in the middle of your Bible. And if you need to use the search function, if you're using an app, or the table of contents, if you're using a paper Bible, either one is entirely okay. But while you're turning there, I'm going to pray to set our hearts right to hear from God's Word. Father, we thank you so much for the good news of the gospel that we can revel in. That for those who have been saved, we have been saved not because of our works, but because of your love. And I ask that you would reveal to us once again your amazing grace to us. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to the truth you want to reveal to us this morning. Continue to transform us into the likeness of Jesus 
by this powerful word that you've written by your spirit. Thank you that you can use all things for your glory and honor, and I pray that this morning we would give you all the glory and honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so usually we'd have a scripture video, but for the psalm series, we decided we're going to have the preachers read it. Not because we needed to give the people who create the videos a break or anything. I mean, maybe that has something to do with it, but I'm going to read Psalm 13, which starts out saying, to the choir master, a psalm of David. Now, before I get reading it too much, sometimes you'll read the Bible and you notice these little headings. In the psalms, the headings are actually part of the scripture. So that means that this psalm was supposed to be a song sung. So it says, to the choir master, psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. So I want to ask you, when was the last time that you were in a crisis? When was the last time you can tell which way was up and which way was down? Have you ever been in that place where you just feel like everything around you has started to crash down. There's no floor beneath you. The walls are caving in. You just feel trapped. Maybe you just bought a house and you're expecting things to be going smoothly and it's crazier and dirtier and harder than you ever thought it would be. Maybe someone comes to your door and they tell you that there's been an accident. You get a phone call from the doctor's office with the results that you thought were just going to be for a routine test. Maybe you feel a buzz in your pocket, you pick up the phone only to realize it's that text you've really been dreading that all it says is, we need to talk. If you're over the age of 10, you've likely experienced some kind of crisis. Whether you've experienced it directly or you've been surrounded by people who have gone through tough times, as good as life can be, as wonderful as life can be and as beautiful as it is, this broken world that we live in is filled with tragedies, difficulties, pain, and sorrow. And as David writes this psalm here, we can tell that he's going through something heavy, isn't he? You see, the thing about the psalms is that it's not just this collection of nice poems about the attributes of God. Yes, don't get me wrong, the, the psalms tell us a lot about God, but the Psalms can actually get pretty dark, pretty gritty. So what I find amazing about this ancient poetry is that it actually gives us permission to express the full range of emotions with how we relate to God and how we experience Him. You see, God knows that you're not always going to be thinking right thoughts and feeling right feelings. There will be times when you doubt Him, when you question His goodness, and when you just feel like you don't know if you can trust him. And in those times, the Psalms actually, they can be a way for us to express those feelings, to identify with them, and then to bring them in line with the truth of God's character. Remember, this, this said that this was a song to be sung by God's people. And on this fir these first two verses of this Psalm, David, this is the same David who is famous for defeating the giant Goliath. It's the same David who would become Israel's most loved king. David is crying out to God saying, how long? We see this repeated four times in these first two verses. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow all in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? 
Have you ever been in that really painful season of your life and you just find yourself questioning over and over again, how long? See, it's one thing to go through suffering knowing when it's going to end. But it's another thing entirely when you don't know what's happening. And the hard part is that most of the time when we go through these seasons of suffering, we don't know when they're going to be finished. We don't know how long they're going to last. Crisis doesn't usually come with an end date that we know about. And in those times, we're likely going to have a lot of questions, probably very similar questions to what David has here. David asks four questions, one to go along with each one of his how longs. Now, the first question he asks reveals how the situation feels to him. Do you see that there? He asks, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? See, he feels like God has forgotten him. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever looked at your circumstances and just started to wonder, has God forgotten about me? Does he not care about what I'm going through? Does he not know about what's happening and how I'm feeling? And is, is, he's getting, is he gonna do anything about this? See, there's times when we feel abandoned by God, like he's forgotten that we even exist. Our circumstances feel dire, we feel hopeless, and, and, and we just feel alone. You feel that way because this is how things look to you. And this is how things look to David as he cries out, how long? But just because this is how David feels, that doesn't mean this is how things are, is it? The truth is that God does not forget about people, does he? Now me, sadly, I I can forget about people. If I don't see someone for a few months at a time, I hate to break this to you, but I might forget I can even go months without thinking about people. But thankfully, God's not like me. He's better than me in every way. He, there's no sin, and he does not forget. He, <laughs> he holds his memories longer than an elephant. God is the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-present God who does not forget about us. But even though God does not forget about us, that does not mean we don't feel like he does, right? Right? And our feelings can so often betray reality. These things can be real wrestles, right? When we're we're trying to deal with our feelings and what's actually going on. When we're coping with life and all its challenges, sometimes that wrestle is just, we forget what's true. And as David wrestles with this question, he asks another one. How long will you hide your face from me? So if this first question reveals how David perceives the situation emotionally, the second one reveals what's going on spiritually. David perceives that God has hidden his face from him. Now, while God has not actually abandoned David, while God has not actually forgotten him, the truth is that God has hidden his face from him. Maybe you're in that same kind of place. At least intellectually, you know God is still there. He knows you. He's not forgotten you. But you feel far from him. You know the closeness that you want with him isn't there. Sometimes this happens when we're in a cycle of persistent sin. We keep going back to old habits and old comforts to distract us from the situation we find ourselves in. And we don't feel close to God because in many ways, we are intentionally avoiding him. We're afraid of what he's going to say when he finds out that we've been indulging in our flesh rather than trusting in his provision. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden who hid themselves from God after eating forbidden fruit, we imagine that somehow we can escape God's punishment and his justice by avoiding him or avoiding his people, or avoiding the reality of his all-knowing presence. That just doesn't make sense, does it? But we still do it. On the other hand, there are times where God hides his face not because of any persistent sin. It's not like we're in unrepentant sin and, and we're intentionally avoiding him. 
but God hides himself as a way for us to be drawn closer to him. So you need to know that just because he's hiding his face for you for a time, that doesn't mean he has hidden his heart from you or his love for you. Like with Job, whose story is recorded in the Old Testament book bearing his name, he was a man who was faced remarkable suffering and sorrow. And God actually purposed everything that Job had gone through to bring Job closer to himself, to give Job a greater picture of who God is and what he's like. And even if we look at the world, the way it's designed to work, think of plants. Think of how he makes things grow. We need more than sunshine to obtain a harvest, right? What, what kind of plants would grow if all we had was day? Probably not many. I don't know of any that do. Plants need rest from the sun. They need cloud, they need rain. They even need some manure in the soil. See, for the Christian, for the one who is loved by God, if you're struggling with feeling that God is not close, if you're feeling like you want him to show himself to you again, if you find yourself crying out to God, I want more of you. I want to feel your presence. I want to experience you like I have before. You need to know that this feeling or even these lack of feelings are the Holy Spirit of God working in your heart. This actually reveals the deepest desires of your heart. That you're not satisfied in a life apart from God. See, it's the unrepentant, the ungodly, the unsaved that don't care about whether or not God's face is shining upon them. In fact, they prefer that he'd stay hidden. They don't want to see God. They don't want God to see them because deep down they know that the light of his face will reveal the darkness in their hearts. And what they await is the just wrath of God. But for those of us who have been saved by Jesus, for those of us who know the love of Christ. Even when it feels like he's far from us, we long to have his face shine down upon us, even if it reveals the darkness in our hearts, because we want to be more like him. We, the exposure of his face on us will actually bring us into the light where we can be transformed into his likeness by his grace. So for the one who finds themselves crying out to God, how long will you hide your face from me? I want you to find comfort in the fact that it's that very longing that God is using to remind you that he will not leave you and he will not forsake you. Now the next question David asks is in verse two. He says, how long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day See, as he cries out, he's, he's trying to figure out what is going on in my heart. He transitions from looking upward with his questions to now looking inward. Do you see that? See, sometimes when it feels like God's abandoned us, when our circumstances are overwhelming, we can just get lost in ourselves. It can be difficult to escape the spiral of sadness and sorrow then. I don't know if you've ever experienced depression, but I know I myself, I've gone through some, some deep seasons of darkness and real depression. And when you are in that space, it can be really hard to escape it. But when all we do is continue to look inward, when all we do is try to fix and comfort ourselves, the most likely outcome is just more and more and more sadness and sorrow. We're broken. We're finite. We're, we are incomplete in and of ourselves. And so there's only so much counsel we can give, and it's not enough. 
Which then leads to the last question David asks, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And so the more we focus on ourselves, the more it's just going to feel like there's no hope. And so when you're in that spot, it can easily feel like everyone around us is against us. Now the truth is we do have enemies. There are people in this world who delight to make our lives miserable. There are people in this world who make our lives miserable not because it's a delight to them. They just do because they don't even know it. David experienced this, and I'm sure there are many of us who ex have experienced this as well. I mean, I had a coworker for a time that just made my life miserable. I was belittled for my faith. I was mocked. I was ridiculed. The crazy thing is that he would have proclaimed to be a Christian. Or let's think about Job again. When he was at one of his lowest points, rather than receive comfort from his wife, the one who you think is supposed to be his helper, who's supposed to encourage him, rather than being reminded of God's goodness and mercy, she tells him, just curse God and die already. What's wrong with you? He's going through a hardship, and that's the best counsel his wife can give. That, that sounds more like the counsel of an enemy, right? We have enemies, but that's not even to mention the spiritual enemies we have. There are spiritual forces at work that are constantly trying to get us to believe the lies that God does not care, that he's out to give us, that he's out to get us, and that our lives are hopeless. And with all this going on, with the external pressures, with the crisis we're going through, with it feeling like God has left us, the enemy just wants to tear us apart. How are we supposed to cope with this? This is how David continues in verse 3 and 4. He says, Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. See, he cries out to God and he just tells him what's going on and he begs for help. He says, consider and answer me, oh my God. See, this isn't David just politely asking. No, this is David desperately demanding that God help him. He knows he's in a dark place. He knows that without God's help, this is going to drive him to death. He says, light up my eyes. This is a phrase of deep, dark depression. Have you ever been in that state where you just feel surrounded by darkness? When you're in that state, even, even if there are glimpses of joy, glimpses of happiness... The dark cloud of depression just finds a way to swallow them up in an instant. See, the cycle of doubt and worry, sadness and fear, it can feel like it's dragging you down in a, into an endless sea of dread. And with life's demands and responsibilities continue to be thrown at you because when you're under that, life just doesn't stop. It just feels like anything you try to grab onto just adds to the weight that is keeping you underwater. And even though it's still there, you can't see God's goodness, you can't see his provision, and you can't see his love. And in that state, it takes a toll on you physically as well. If you've ever been depressed, you know that there will be times that all you want to do is sleep. It's a battle to stay awake, partially because of that mental exhaustion of just fighting with yourself and trying to escape this depression, fighting with your emotions. But also partially because you just don't want to face another day of feeling utterly hopeless. I don't know if you've been there. But I have. So I can so relate to David what he's going through here with this constant tug of war between just slipping into an apathetic tiredness and a desperation of trying to find a way out of it. Now, we do need to understand that not every case of depression is circumstantial or purely spiritual in nature. There can be a good and right time to seek a counselor, talk to a doctor, even take a medication. Truth is, our bodies and minds are complex to the extent that even the most studied experts 
still struggle at times to know what is exactly happening and why. There's a lot we don't know. We live in a broken world where every aspect of creation has been affected by the curse of sin. So that means that our body, our mind, and how we experience our emotions and our feelings, they just don't always work right. You can have a great spiritual practice. You can be doing well with your Bible reading, with your gathering with the church. You can be doing your best to be obedient and still feel like garbage. I mean, even with what we eat or how much or how little we exercise, th these things can have a great effect on our mood and our, and our ability to process things. But because we're, we're not simply a body with a spirit, nor are we just a spirit with a body, the complexity of what makes us us means that we can't just be isolated and separated. We are what we are. And what we do physically affects how we feel mentally and spiritually, and the state of our spirit affects our physical bodies as well. It's all intertwined, and sometimes, sometimes we need to fix a physical issue so that we can better deal with the spiritual side. So these things are all, can all be true at the same time. But something I think we need to think about is that we need to not be so quick to the conclusion that our answers are only to be found medically or therapeutically. Because we live in a time and a place where we can so easily find ourselves defining who we are by a medical label or a diagnosis as if that carries the final word of my identity. And I find that we're allowing the broader therapeutic culture of doctors and counselors to have a bigger influence on us and the outlook of our lives than, than Jesus, who is said to be our wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Who is it we're going to our peace for? So as, as good as it might be to get physically examined, as good as it is to talk to someone about what's going on, we cannot neglect to talk to God about it. So when David examines himself in the situation, he comes to the realization that there is no hope in himself. So he cries out to God, consider and answer me. He realizes he's come to the end of his rope and there's nothing left but for God to intervene. I don't know if you've ever been there. But now look, at, look closer at me. Or not at me, but look closer at the text with me. Verse 3. Look how he addresses God. He says, O Lord, my God. See, the word Lord in all caps, it's the name God has declared of himself. It's Yahweh or Jehovah, however you want to pronounce it. It's God's personal name. See, David is not just crying out to some generic deity, some unnamed, unknowable, unapproachable God. He says, oh Lord, he says, Yahweh, my God, my God. In all his suffering, in all his sadness, with the darkness closing in around him, David does not forget that he belongs to God. Like the bride in the Song of Songs addresses her husband, I am my beloved and he is mine. See, as David cries out, as David prays, he does not forget his identity. As much as he might feel abandoned, as much as he awaits rescue from the darkness in his prayer, he cries out to the only one he knows who can offer him the hope, the deliverance, and the relief he so desperately craves. And he asks God not to let the enemy take him ca captive. He's saying, don't let the enemy win. Don't let me succumb to my emotions, my fears, and this endless sorrow. 
Don't let me give up. Because we have to remember that we have a spiritual enemy that would love to see us give up on life, give up on God, or give up on our identity in Jesus. Any one of those he'd be happy with. See, our enemy wants to do everything he can to shake us off the solid ground of Jesus. But as much as it might feel like our circumstances are out of our control, or even outside of God's control, as much as we might feel like we've taken our last breath before we fall under the waves in the sea of despair, like David, we can cry out to God because we are not without hope. We need to remember that what we are feeling, what our emotions tell us, these things are not always true. But do you see what David's been doing here this whole time? He's bringing his feelings to God, right? He's expressing his emotions. He's venting his frustrations. He's releasing his fears. Now, some of us have grown up in households where we've been told to just completely disregard our emotions. Logic rules this home. Facts are all that matters. Take your feelings and shove them. There are others, though, they Maybe we've grown up in homes where we're told that what we feel makes us who we are. We're fiery. We're Italian. We're passionate because we're Spanish. Like, you know, those are stereotypical things that our feelings define us because of the culture we grew up in, or the household we grew up in. But what we find in the scriptures is that even though our feelings are not to define us, it's not like they're useless. Part of us being created in the image of God actually means we have feelings and emotions because God has feelings. God has emotions. God himself experiences joy, anger, sadness, jealousy, betrayal, disappointment, excitement, and compassion. See, when God's describing his character to the Israelites, this is what he says of himself. Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7. The Lord... That's the name Yahweh. Passed before him, talking about Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. See, when I read this, I can't help but to read this as well as the entirety of the Old Testament and end up seeing a God who is crazy patient. He's crazy patient with a people who continually forsake and ignore him. He's slow to anger. But that doesn't mean he does not get angry, right? Right? He shows and he feels anger. Or let's look at the New Testament. You look at the life of Jesus like we've been doing as we go through the Gospel of Luke. You get to see the full range of emotion on display there too. See, Jesus wasn't just this emotionless, stoic guru walking around like a robot and, you know, talking in some monotone voice. That's not what we see. When Jesus' friend Lazarus died, we're told that he wept. And on the night that he was betrayed, as he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, as he's praying to his father, we're told that he prayed with such passion and emotion that he was sweating drops of blood. But just because we have, an emo have emotions, just because God has emotions, just because they're there for a good reason, that doesn't mean that they are to control us, right? We don't stuff them down or ignore them, but we don't also don't let them control us. I love how Brian Loritz puts it. He's a teaching pastor at the Summit Church, and he says that emotions or feelings are like a two-year-old or a toddler. So he says, imagine if you're going for a drive and you have your toddler with you. There's a proper place for them, right? 
And that place for them is to be harnessed in their car seat. You see, if you put your toddler in the trunk, you're going to jail. Like, that's not the right place for them. They don't belong there. But likewise, if you put your toddler in the driver's seat, you're going to get everyone in your vehicle killed. If you have your toddler in the car seat, if they're harnessed there, you can interact with them, you can talk with them, you can enjoy them, and even if they're throwing a temper tantrum, they're contained in a way that you can still safely drive your vehicle. See, in the same way, our emotions, they have a good and a proper place. We should feel them, we should experience them. We don't stuff them down and we don't hide them, but we also don't let them control us. Our emotions are not in charge. Don't go with your feelings. As the prophet Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful. But if we look back and just see how this has all been unfolding, we see David is not stuffing his emotions down, is he? He's not letting them control him either, though. He's giving them to God. And as we unpack our feelings to God, as we express our emotions to him, as we vent our frustrations, things change, don't they? Because look at how all of a sudden the trajectory changes in verse 5. Do you see that? There's a transition word in there that is just glorious. It all changes with that single word. But. This is one of those amazing words that we find all throughout Scripture, and it is like one of the best transition words. I know things look one way, but this is how it is. You meant evil for me, but God meant it for good. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God being rich in mercy. Perhaps for a good person would someone die, but God shows his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That but there makes a huge difference, doesn't it? So in the midst of David's lamenting and pouring out his heart to God while he reveals his lack and his need, his sorrow, his pain, it's like he stops himself. And like the prodigal son who has come back to his senses, it's like his eyes have started to receive the light he's been asking for. Do you see that? He says, but... I'm tired. Things look bleak. I don't know how much longer I can go on. But. He says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. It says he trusted in God's steadfast love. See, God's steadfast love is his covenant love. His gracious, undeserving love. This is like, as the, I love how the Jesus Storybook Bible puts it. It says, never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. This is the love that David reminds himself that God truly has. Notice what it doesn't say here too, right? It doesn't say, but you have delivered me from my circumstances. Or you have rescued me from my afflictions. It doesn't say, but, but you have delivered me from my enemies. It simply says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. See, when we are facing crises, when depression seems to have a stranglehold on us, when our emotions seem like they're getting the better of us, we can bring all these things to the one we trust. Are you doing that? Do you even believe you can do that? I know if you're going through a hard time right now, it might be difficult to even believe you can bring these things to God. But 
What do you think is going to happen if you do it? What happens for David? What does David do? He says, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. See, David knows what he's been feeling. He's not denying it. He's, he's right up there, right? God, you've forsaken me. You've forgotten me. I don't know where you are. The enemy's closing in around me and I just want to die. But my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. He knows what his circumstances are, but he decides that he shall rejoice. He is going to tell his feelings what to do. Now, again, some of you might be wondering, well, how am I supposed to do this when I'm depressed? How can, I, how can you just rejoice when everything around you is just crashing down? Isn't that hypocritical? No. The hypocrite is the one who knows the right thing to do and refuses to do it. The hypocrite is not the one who tells his feelings or her feelings to get in line with the truth. And the truth is that for the Christian, some of our deepest joys can actually come in the middle of pain, brokenness, sadness, sorrow, and even depression. Because when everything else is taken away, and you don't have the, the shallow comforts of the world to dull your need for God, it's in those times when we can actually find a greater joy that can be found in the comfort of a heavenly Father who will never leave us or forsake us. And that's better than anything else that this world could offer. And it often comes when we choose to worship Him, when we choose to praise Him, not because of what we are experiencing right now, but because purely about who He is. We praise Him for His goodness, His grace, His mercy, His provision. And we remind ourselves of the truth of who He is. And again, we tell our feelings to fall in line with the reality of what's been accomplished for us. So that means in those seasons when we feel down, we feel dark, we don't know what to do, we actually lift our voices and yes, even our hands in praise. And many times it's not even because we feel it. It's not because we feel so excited, but because we want to. We want to give glory to the God who deserves our praise. We recognize that life is hard, life is difficult, life is full of sorrow and pain, and yet there is a God who stands and is worthy of our worship. There's a God who is seated at the throne, who is in control, and he deserves our praise. And we know that we're desperate for him. See, we see here that David rejoices in the Lord because he knows that God has dealt bountifully with him and will continue to do so. And yet David didn't even know the depths of how bountifully God would deal with his people. See, for, for us, thousands of years later, we now have an even greater picture of God's love than David could have ever dreamt of. See, David knew that God was gracious, merciful, abounding in steadfast love and mercy. But we know that it was the grace of God that compelled Jesus, the very Son of God, to take on human form, to become God in the flesh, to become like us only without sin, to get into the muck and mire of humanity. And Jesus, like I said before, he would live a life full of emotion, right? Right? He would feel pain and sorrow, and yet he would trust his Father in every aspect of it. And out of this steadfast love that he has for us, because of his great mercy for sinners like me and you, Jesus willingly went to the cross, feeling the full weight of God's justice and wrath being poured out on himself. 
And Jesus would even cry out to his heavenly father while on the cross, expressing his feelings of being forsaken and abandoned by God because the father had turned his face away from his son as he willingly became the sin sacrifice for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. So think about it. When, when you realize the depths of love that God has for you, when you realize that it was actually your sin that put Jesus on that cross, that he was paying for your rebellion, your self-righteousness, your self-justification, when you realize that he took what you deserved, how can you not have the most joyful sorrow and sorrowful joy that you've ever experienced? To be Christian is to understand that both can be true at the same time, right? So we can lament and we can have joy. They're not mutually exclusive. But we don't just rejoice in our circumstances, but we rejoice in a God who gives us reason for rejoicing regardless of our circumstances. And it might just be that the circumstances we are going through, if they are hard, if they are difficult, or if they are joyful, they are there in order for us to see and savor God's goodness and grace to us. Many times in the middle of pain, sorrow, and suffering. So we rejoice in the steadfast love of the Lord when we get that phone call with the bad prognosis. We can rejoice in the steadfast love of the Lord when we receive that text telling us it's time to talk. And we can even rejoice in the Lord when the officer tells us there's been an accident. It's not because our circumstances are good, not because we feel happy and clappy and just overflowing with abundance and prosperity and physical blessing. But even when there are tears streaming down our face of sadness and depression, even with sorrow that would otherwise feel unbearable, we rejoice because we know who our God is. We know of his salvation and we believe that he has dealt bountifully with us and he will continue to do so. Father, I just ask right now that you would allow us to truly praise you and worship you because you have dealt so bountifully with us through Jesus. Father, help us to experience joy in the midst of sadness, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of crisis. Father, would you give us a peace that passes all understanding, that allows us to praise you and worship you as you deserve. Father, no matter what we're going through, help us to remember that even when it feels like you're not there, we can trust that you are. Even when we don't feel your face shining down upon us, we trust in your steadfast love. And Father, as we go through these times, would you bring us out? Would you allow us to feel the warmth of your face shining down upon us? Would you allow us to come out of the sea of despair, experiencing joy and fullness and hope? Because in you lies our hope. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.